Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. I'm Warren Pies, founder and chief strategist at 314 Research. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Vincent Deluard, global macro strategist at StoneX. Vincent, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm very happy to be here. So it's going to be fun. Yeah, um, excited to talk to you. Um, in case you weren't aware, this is the daily briefing. So we we start with what's going on in the markets today. And, uh, you know, stocks were up again, bonds down, yields up, commodities down more or less. And this is kind of the continuation of a move we've seen over the last week is, is the way I would look at it. And I've really, uh, you know, it's expanded out to that last week's move. Um, I've really struggled to understand what's behind this move. And I know, like me, you're a leaning to the bearish side on the markets, um, trying to find evidence of uh, the, the reasons to get bullish. And, and there's an old saying in markets, nothing like price to change sentiment. And that's what it feels like to me. It feels like price has changed sentiment. Just a week ago, everybody was giving you all these reasons to be out of the market, to raise cash. And today it's all about how the economy's strong. We can handle uh, higher interest rates, yada, yada, yada. There have been a number of technical signals that we would call breadth thrusts that have fired over the last few days. The way we measured at 314, we haven't seen that, but we're watching it and it has been close. Um, an interesting chart today, we did break above the 200-day moving average on the S&P 500. Uh, a chart that we're going to show here at 314, we kind of broke apart every combination of moving averages to look at which ones really matter in the, in the sharp ratio for just following a simple strategy to get in the market when you're above the 200-day. And or that the moving average of that duration that we're looking at and out of the market below that moving average. And what you can see in this highlighted box is that this 200 day moving average area, about 150 to 200 days, is a really uh, historically key moving average. So there are a lot of systems that are going to be built on getting long again when you break above a moving average like this. And I think there are ways to improve those systems is very simplistic, but you get the point. So. With that said, what do you make of this rally? How do you square it with the beginning of the year and what's behind it? Wow, a lot of questions here. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would make, try to derive too much economic meaning um, from this rally. Um, one pattern that we've seen in recent years is these very strong end of quarter, end of month rallies. So this is March 22, if you remember, the COVID market bear bottom was March 23. Uh, before that, if you go back to 2018, um, the 23 was Sunday, so the market bottom on 24, the Christmas massacre. Uh, and then even if you go before that, the uh, Volmageddon ended up also, I think, March 23 or March 24. Um, so this is a, I've done some work with, with Mike Green, uh, simplify on that, just looking at um, returns uh, for the stock market when um, we have a big correction in the last week of the quarter. And then you've seen this anomaly, unexplainable anomaly over the past seven, eight years where you have these extraordinary returns in the last week of the month, last week of the quarter when stocks are down. Now, my theory for that is that we have the emergence of this whale, the target date from the whale, um, which, you know, is about three trillion now in target data assets and, and it's really mechanic, right? I mean, every, every month, you know, two weeks, a portion of your paychecks for seven to 10% get wired automatically by default into a QDIA account, which typically goes into a target date fund. And that target date fund has to keep a certain balance between stocks and bonds. So if, as was the case up until this morning, <laughs> stocks are down and, and, and bonds are up or down less than stocks, which was the case up until this morning, Come the end of the quarter, you have to rebalance, you sell bonds, you buy stocks. That seems to me like a pretty good description of what's happening today and in the past week. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I know that the, the works always fascinate me on, on the, the target date funds um, and just more or less rebalancing mechanics underlying the market. Um, I, I guess the, the real logical question for me is that getting a chance to talk to you here in this format is, is this a sustainable rally? In, your, in the most recent report that you shared with me, you, you came out and made some big, bold predictions. I want to read a quick quote from that, set the table for you, and let you answer if this is sustainable, given that this is what your report said. 
Quote, this report will solve this contradiction by making three clear and verifiable forecasts. Number one, a bear market has started. Number two, inflation will not decelerate as much as the Fed hopes. And number three, the economy will not fall into a recession in 2022. So those are three big predictions. Um, you say the bear market started. So is this rally going to peter out or do you think it has legs? Well, let me answer on the macro part, on the economic part, and then we'll, we'll get to the market because um, I think that's just the logical order. Um, coming off the Fed meetings last week, I mean, I had a very strong feeling of cognitive dissonance. Uh, of hearing, you know, two things that could not be both true at the same time. Uh, and, and I think that's how most people felt. Uh, basically, the Fed was saying the economy is extremely strong. I think he used the word strong 43 times. Um, and uh, also, inflation is going to fall gently to 2% by the end of, of 2023. And that's going to happen with, you know, seven rate hikes. Um, and um, yeah, the cognitive difference comes from the fact that either of these things can be true. Uh, either uh, the economy isn't even all that strong, uh, which tend to be my camp, and we're going to need inflation is not going to come away, and we're going to need more rate hikes. Or, which I think is the, the camp of a lot of people I follow and respect on Twitter, is like the economies are actually already weakening. You look at the bond market, you look at you know yield curve, you look at. Uh, um, co corporate bond spreads and demand disruption from all, all high oil prices and the Fed is over tightening into a recession and they will have to, to pivot back in, in 2023. Um, these are two intellectually consistent positions. The Fed is not. So faced with that junction, my view is, okay, I'm going to go with the too hot gap. We're going to have too much inflation. We will not have a recession in 2022. Now, of course, this is a Keteris Paribus, all else equal assumption, right? I mean, assuming it's, you know, we, we keep oil at around 100 to 130 and we don't need to have like, you know, 10, 10 rate hikes or something. So as of now, uh, I don't think we have a recession in 2022 and I think we have inflation. Now, turning this into a market forecast, um, what I did is I looked at the history of bear markets um, and I classified them. Uh, was that a recessionary bear, inflationary, inflationary and recessionary, recessionary inflationary and non-recessionary? And what I found is that what really matters is the inflation question. If anything, actually, if you have a recessionary bear, which is what everybody seems to be afraid of, it's actually more shallow because at some point the Fed put kicks in, right? I mean, if you have a recession, you cut rates, you get some liquidity, you know, people start buying stocks again. If you do have what I expect to be an inflationary bail without necessarily a recession, you don't have your Fed put. I like to um, say that we don't have a Fed put, we have a Fed short call. So people are all, everybody's expecting, oh, when, when is the Fed put going to kick in? I would fit that question. It's like, what do you think happens if we make a new high in the S&P 500? I mean, of course the Fed is going to tighten. So it's like the Fed has, short, has, has sold a call against future market gains, and I'm not really sure if the Fed would exist, and if it does, at what level it is. I mean, that's an interesting analogy. It's kind of similar to how we thought of the market too. Uh, it, what we would say is that every one of these rallies is kind of self-defeating because at the end of it, you have the Fed waiting there just uh, to drop the hammer on, on risk assets. Um, and to that point today, we had Bullard come out and basically make the case for 50 basis point hikes, the market's starting to lean that way for May. The consensus is floating to 50 and then another 50 in June. Uh, you're saying seven, is that your base case for the Fed hikes this year? Or what, how do you see that path evolving if you even do that kind of work? Yeah, I think the uncertainty here is, is really enormous. Um, so seven, I mentioned seven because this is what I said last week and this is more or less what what the, the Fed funds futures market is, is pricing. Um, if I had to make, I have, if I had to take a position here, I would probably be over that. Um, I think we'll get um, nasty inflation numbers. Uh, we haven't seen the impact of, of Russia uh, on, on inflation, and we are already accelerating at, at 8%. I mean, remember, I mean, people, you know, it was supposed to slow down in summer of 2021, then the fall, then the winter, then that, you know, 7.5 was the peak. We're already at eight without this. So it's hard for me to imagine a world where inflation does not reach double digit in a couple of months. Uh, when 
that happens, I think there will be pressure on the Fed to maybe just throw. I, I think that was the idea with Ballard, right? I mean, just just front, you know front load that thing. Uh, we're already behind the curve. You know, it's, it's always always going to be easier to kind of take take hikes after, but. The prior, so it could be that it goes that way. Now, of course, the Fed is, is a political entity. Um, the U.S. economy is very asset price dependent. Uh, there will be other concerns that will go uh, at the Fed. But if I were to make a guess, yeah, I think more than seven. Okay, so we take the over on seven. Um, given that outlook, if you see inflation but strong growth, uh, I mean, the, and you're basically outright saying the bond market is wrong. Is that? Correct. So it's a pretty big statement to say the bond market is wrong. So uh, I would I would imagine you like commodities and real assets in this environment. What do you what is it that you how would you recommend your clients position themselves given the outlook? Yeah, no, uh, on the bond market. I, and I know it's, you know, because over time you look at this chart of, of yields versus nominal GDP growth for inflation and, and the bond market has been more right than wrong uh, for, for a long period of time. So it is indeed a. Uh, I would say on a consensus. I mean, a lot of the uh, the people I, I like and, and follow on even you know, on this platform. I mean, uh, you know, if you think about someone like uh, Alex Gurevich, like um, you, uh, <laughs> like uh, Macro Alf. I mean, they generally respect the bond market. Um, I think, yeah. So there's really two 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 parts to my distrust of the bond market. One is I think. You know, it's wrong on inflation, and I think it's been wrong for a long time. I mean, you can, I mean, there are literally hours of me on YouTube talking about inflation as early as, as late 2019. So um, on this, I don't think I need to, to make my case anymore. I think it's, it's more the, the, the people who think we're going to see this inflation who, needs to, who need to justify how that would happen. So there's the inflation component. And then on the very mechanic of the bond market, I, again, I think it's, it's a, a case of the tail wagging the dog. I mean, we have, um, you know, Obviously, the, the bond market, the Fed has intervened in the, form, in the well, all central banks have been intervening, intervening in every bond market so that price message has been um, degraded. And we also have this target date fund mechanism. I think one thing that happened last year is because equities were rallying so fast, uh, target date funds were systematically underweight bonds. Uh, so what they did every quarter is they had to buy bonds in order to catch up with equities. And now if you think about the way the market saw that, it's like, well, oh no, yields are low. The bond market is well bid, so that means inflation is transitory, so that means equities can rally some more. So we had this really weird circular reasoning going on, and it could be that the Fed has been um, is, is misjudging, misjudging what the bond market is telling. Yeah, um, and so just a quick chart that we've been showing to kind of uh, get into how to position portfolios in this environment. So the chart here, Brian, with the scatter plot that I gave you, we're looking at uh, high yield credit spreads versus break even, 10 year break even inflation. So, historically, this chart's showing that there's a linear relationship between these two series. So, historically, in the modern American economy, especially since 1998, we've seen inflation fall and we're in, along with growth, which means that spreads blow out when inflation falls. What we're seeing here recently in the month of February is something I think is really interesting. It's uh, what we would call a stagflationary smile emerging in this data. So we're now starting to see this these red dots uh, that are highlighted on the chart kind of pull out and move up. And so what we're seeing now is inflation is rising at the same time that high yield credit spreads are widening. This is a really unprecedented in modern American market history. And what I would say is this is the first emerging evidence of stagflation. Our view has been we didn't see a, a, a big risk to stagflation, but obviously Russia, Ukraine has changed that calculus. We'll get into that in a minute. But to me, now you're, you, everyone's in a scramble to understand, number one, what does stagflation mean, how you define it? And number two, what assets work in this environment? Uh, do you have any thoughts on what assets work in this stagflationary environment that we are potentially looking at, right? I mean, the first thing about stagflation is that it, it is the the worst um, economic configuration for for the sixty forty portfolio. Uh, most of the, the stuff that we are most invested in by, by default, alone, I mean, that's what a target date fund is, right? It's a combination of stocks and bonds, and it's based on the notion that growth is going to be positive. 
uh, inflation is going to be limited and the correlation between the two is going to be negative. Uh, everything we do, whether it's with parity, um, I mean, most money, I, professionally managed money is managed based on this format. Stagflation is further wrench into this. Um, and it's it's difficult because obviously bonds are the big, big loser, especially long duration. But in the case of U.S. stocks, because we have such a long duration stock market, um, I think this is you know highly valued long duration assets perform very poorly uh, during periods of stagflation. So you could see bonds and stocks go down at the same time. I expect uh, to see this uh, in, in the coming decade. Um, things that do well, I think we're trying to figure it out. Um, you know, I think people are trying to understand. Um, are starting to realize that your treasuries are no longer going to hedge your, your stocks. And you've seen that every big correction in the stock market, treasuries actually yields went up, prices went down. Um, and we're looking for, for a, some sort of a safe haven asset. I mean, people, for a while people thought it was going to be crypto. I think this has not worked very well this year. Gold, finally, is doing better. Commodities, gold, I think, to have, have a role to play. I would, I would add emerging markets to this list. Uh, you have very nice carry across Latin American bonds. You have positive real rates in, in China, Indonesia. Um, I like the Swiss franc um, as, a, as, a, as a risk of asset. But uh, I think you need to look outside of the 60-40 portfolio. And, and this need is only going to increase as this taxation environment becomes the new normal. Yeah, I mean... That makes sense. Uh, just to kind of distinguish our views at 314, uh, and some of this you're familiar with, but you know, coming into the year, we were more or less bearish. And but at the same time, we've made the case that cycles are compressing. Uh, the U.S. economy is more asset price dependent now than it's ever been, and so as interest rates, monetary policy, the transmission mechanism between monetary policy and the real economy, I think actually has shortened. Uh, contrary to the kind of arguments that it seems like you're making, which is that the real economy and markets have divorced from each other. But, um, you know, it, the, the, the big change to that has been the conflict, the war between Russia and Ukraine, and the what we calculate back at the envelope to be a resultant 4 million barrel a day, which is about 4% of global demand deficit in the global crude oil market. So we've been arguing, really even leading up to that, the, the, the war, that energy stocks need to be an overweight in your portfolio. That this, these stocks hedge a, a bunch of tail risks to this market. And so that's been kind of our portfolio construction and how we've been positioning clients. Here recently, uh, Maggie Lake got to speak to Michael Cow, who's a friend of mine and somebody I've been on Real Vision twice with about his outlook for oil prices. Why don't we take a listen to what Mike said? What, what are you looking at for oil prices? Well, I'll tell you, before the Russia-Ukraine wild card, my scenario was that we wouldn't officially enter the structural phase of the, of the uh, oil bull market until late 23. Um, and that, you know, there, there is still uh, spare capacity in the world, albeit dwindling. And you know, even the most conservative assumptions of um, how much global spare capacity there is get get challenged by the end of 23. Now, this the Russia-Ukraine conflict just puts a huge wild card in everything because now, um, even though the energy sector of Russia isn't officially sanctioned, we have all seen that as a result of self-sanctions and lack of insurance and whatnot, um, we saw that massive spike to 130. Now it's kind of eased back. But the question I keep contending with, and I don't have a good answer for this, I, I, I wish I had a crystal ball on this, is will the um, long-term supply destruction be greater than or less than the long-term demand destruction? And mm. it's real. It's really hard to figure out right now because, you know, if you have six months of a hundred plus oil, um, you know, you're 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 definitely going to see demand destruction. But then the question is, how much, how long, how 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 long are is Russian production going to be disrupted, and whether or not the Russians need to shut in or not. 
All right. So that was Mike Cal's uh, take on the oil market. I think uh, him and I were of a similar mind that the big bull market was probably more scheduled for 2023 before the, the war. Um, but now uh, we've made the case that under certain scenarios of how this thing breaks, there's more or less no ceiling on the price of oil. So I know from talking to you previous to this conversation, Vincent, that oil is kind of a risk factor to your call. Is that is that correct? Yeah, on the on the recession call for sure. Um, on the inflation, obviously, the the higher oil prices go, the I mean, as you know, the impact of, of oil on the CPI, not just who its direct impact is fairly small, like less less than seven percent, but I mean, oil goes in everything we consume. So obviously, um, you know, oil higher prices are oil prices are inflationary now. In terms of my no recession call, yes, I, I think. I think Michael is asking the right question here. You know, um, we know the supply destruction, uh, so let's go with your estimate for million barrels a day. Um, you look at the market; it's hard to see where that's going to come from. I mean, we're going to have to beg Saudi Arabia. Are they going to help us? Do they want to help us? Can they help us? Uh, and then you go down the list. I mean, you know, you and Michael are the old experts here, so I'm not going to see your thunder. But no, I, mean, I, I think that you have. Uh, we're, we're looking at four million three to four million under the most favorable assumptions uh, go, coming into this. And so, you know, that's assuming an, a million barrel a day increase out of um, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we could get increased shale supplies, but that's probably at the minimum six months away, probably more like nine months away, just because we're still, we've worked through most of the, the duck inventories. It just happened that duck inventories were at a more or less all time low uh, coming into this whole thing. So it leaves us with a huge gap, no matter how you run the numbers. So this is just to me is uh, uh, really problematic for the for the economy and why we go back to that stagflationary smile is that we if we have three or four million barrels a day deficit uh, post uh, going forward in the oil market, you know, you start looking down the list of recessions globally and how much oil demand each recession has killed. And historically, the average recession kills about one and a half million barrels a day of oil demand. You go back to 2008, the Great Recession, 3.1 million barrels of global oil demand come, came off the market, peaked the trough in that recession. So in, when you start thinking about three to four million barrel a day gap going coming out of this war, there's a very little precedent for closing that gap in a natural occurring recession. The only other time we've seen that kind of demand destruction is through COVID in mobility restrictions. And we've already seen the European 10-point plan for energy uh, conservation, which includes uh, dialing down thermostats and things like that. So uh, I think that it's a huge problem for the, the global economy. We don't think natural demand destruction really starts occurring until we get to about $130 a barrel, maybe that $130 to $150 barrel number. So it leads me right back to the place that we've been the last few weeks on, that I've been on the daily briefing here at Real Vision, which is you need to have a healthy dose of energy equities in your portfolio. You need to have, you need to have an overweight. There's a huge momentum rotation that's coming into the energy sector from, from just straight up quant momentum strategies that we are gonna talk about in our upcoming report. There's a tiny door with a lot of market cap that needs to get into a little market cap in this energy space. So the move could be pretty powerful and get the tailwind of higher oil prices. They'll be even stronger. And then finally, what we've done is oil adjusted valuations for the group, we think are going to get re-rated 40% higher. So even after you control for oil prices, uh, we see the, the multiples of this group expanding. So I think you've rightly seen the energy sector get discounted over the last five years as terminal, terminal values came into question, you know, ESG, the um, the uh, the whole fossil fuel industry has been kind of on the outs. You know, divestment has been the kind of zeitgeist, and so I think this reverses multiples expand. You get a number of tailwinds, and you get a number of hedges by having this overweight in your portfolio. Do you see anything that you disagree with with that, or are you are you overweight or recommending these types of natural resource plays? Also, I mean, I I'm the inflation guy, so. <laughs> uh, commodities have, um, I think, a big role to play in the portfolio. Uh, no, I, I agree with the analysis. One thing 
I, as Michael pointed out, I think, and can you point out is, you know, at what point uh, do we get that demand destruction? Um, and I, I've been looking for that as, as a risk to my economic outlook to look of no recession. Uh, so far, I would say, yes, you see it in Europe uh, already, uh, but again, it's because Europeans are, are poor in general. I mean, you know, like um, 20 euros on, um, you know, on filling up, it's gonna make a big difference for people, especially when, when your utilities bill has, has doubled or tripled. Um, so I, one good thing about COVID is you see the mobility data. I remember Apple and Google, they, they track people, how they move. So they keep publishing that. So I, I was looking at it, saying it, are we seeing demands, you know, are we seeing people drive less? The answer is in Europe, yes. In the U.S., no. I think in the U.S. we still have. I mean, people are unhappy for sure. Like it's, you know, I mean, California, it's ridiculous. Uh, but you know, at the same time, we've been cooked in for, um, you know, two years. Um, you know, spring is coming, summer is coming. Uh, people still have. That's the part where you mentioned the, the asset price dependency. I would argue that we're still living off that great wealth boom of 2020, 2021, and it's going to take some time before we wind down the savings. Uh, you know, savings rate shot up to 20% in 2020. We're still at eight, which is you know higher than average. Um, if you look at the household net worth, it increased by 40 trillion since March 2020. Now, by contrast, it had decreased by less than eight trillion in 2008. So this is like five great financial crises on top of each other as a positive wealth shock. So to me, this is gonna get us through, assuming we don't go, I kind of agree with the idea of you know, demand destruction of maybe 150. Um, this is going to keep demand and consumption strong. I mean, it's gonna be unpleasant as, as Bloomberg told us, you know, nobody said this would be fun. Uh, but I think the US consumer is, is in decent shape enough to take it for now. Um, that's also the message I get, and another um, economic data set I, I look very carefully at is the uh, daily, daily treasury statement, basically how much in taxes um, the treasury collects every day. So it's real time, it covers everybody, and it's hard cash payment. It always amazes me that economists don't look at this stuff, probably because it's too simple and they would lose their jobs if, if people knew, knew about this data set. You can go for it, you know, dts.gov, you can see the time series, and then you see, and there hasn't been any change in the tax flow from, from this year to the last. So. In the first 60 years, 60, 60 calendar years, you see uh, tax collection overall between uh, without, non without, and, and business up 15% year, sorry, 13% year over year. So let's say you're, I'm high on inflation. I, I think there's about 9 to 10% inflation right now. Um, that's still 0% review of growth. Um, so again, if we don't have this spike in energy prices, which is definitely a possibility. I think the economy can keep chugging along in, in 2022, maybe, you know, who knows what happens in 2023, but for now, I would stick with an over session call. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with, uh, I mean, we were long equities and long the market last year based primarily or big for uh, largely based off of the amount of stimulus we'd seen. And uh, it's something we both pointed out in our research is the two quarter lag that you get with the wealth effect onto consumption. So there is a bit of a lag. It's not an immediate transmission mechanism, but still from our point of view, 41% of household net worth is in the US stock market. And that is by far an all time high. Um, consumption is a larger percentage of GDP uh, than it's ever been. So I think you are a consumption based economy that is ultimately consumption is being fueled, as you said, and what we're saying by asset prices. So once you get and so much of the market is built on low interest rates. I mean, we have, you know, something you pointed out and we've had our own studies looking at is the amount of long duration stocks in the market has swelled. So we have, a, I would say, a record interest rate sensitivity embedded in the stock market right now. So rates start moving, market starts falling, consumption starts turning over. And that's about a two quarter period, but I think the stock market discounts all that stuff much faster than the consensus would have us believe. I see that you're raising your hand. Go ahead, what do you have? Thank you, so two, two things. Uh, one on the 41%, um, okay, so the household sector, in the, so that's coming from the Fed flow, flows of funds, and the household sector is really a plug, okay? So basically it's anything that's not a depository institution, a bank, an insurance, or something like that. So it, it does not just include a household. Uh, that includes even, um, for example, a hedge fund would fall in there. 
Um, and and even even if we're just looking at households, uh, you know, we have extreme wealth concentration in the U.S. Extreme. So you know, you make a portfolio. You know, say Jeff Bezos entered my room right now. You know, the, my household. Well, we got thirty minutes for to talk, but and we, you and I can talk about it. But basically, it doesn't matter. There, the wealth concentration is always it's well, always towards the top end. It has never not been like that. We don't. It's, we are in a kind of a plutocracy at this point. And that's been the case for quite a while. And so can, can most of consumption is from the top end. It's driven by the top end, by the spinning of the top end. People probably don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. So we have a couple of questions though, before we, we have to move on. A couple of questions. Uh, Vincent, where do you see inflation by year end? Do we ever get to 2% again? Was the other. <laughs> uh, no, certainly not by year end. No, I'm if I were to make a guess, I say we stay, uh, you know, uh, in a range between by year end, I would go between six percent, like say five and five point five and ten. That would be my guess. Five point five and ten. Okay. I'm gonna vote for uh, five, and that's with uh, hundred. That's averaging one hundred and thirty dollar oil, and taking into account the wheat price spike. So I think we get to ten percent in the summer. And then we come down pretty rapidly, but it's still going to be five percent. So I mean, what is that? Pure victory. Um, the uh, what do you think of what do you think of Chile, Argentina, Egypt, and Pakistan? Random, but well, I, I don't think they belong to the same group. So uh, two of the two two of these countries uh, benefit from this, and <laughs> two <laughs> are completely destroyed. So. Um, Chile, Argentina, uh, wonderful. Uh, you know, Chile has more copper than OPEC is oil. Uh, has lithium. Has a big domestic savings. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going there next week, for that matter. Um, I, I'm quite familiar. Uh, I, I think this is one of the big winners of this new era. Uh, in Argentina, they can manage their politics, which historically they failed to. But I mean, this is. Think about a country that has everything. I mean, land, water, oil. I mean, the biggest oil under Vaca, Vaca Muerta. Um, like this is, if they can get the politics in order, I mean, Argentina could be on on a multi-decade bull cycle. And in both cases, especially in the case of Argentina, are very undervalued currencies. Uh, so if you if you believe it as I am in the emerging market golden decade that's building, this is where you want to be. Um, the other two, uh, Egypt, I think, imports uh, more than half of its grain uh, from uh, Ukraine or Russia. Uh, this is a, this is a place where you know, and, and the grain prices are subsidized. And whenever grain grain price go up, I mean, last time that happened, that was the Arab Spring. The time before was 2007, 2008, when we had the great uh, riots all around the world because of high food prices. This is this is the pain point: is Africa, Middle East, non-oil producing. Uh, commodity, uh, um, agricultural importing, so it's, it's Egypt, it's Tunisia, it's Morocco, it's Jordan, uh, Lebanon. These are, I mean, outside of Russia and Ukraine, these are the places that, that are going to suffer the most from this uh, Russia Ukraine crisis. All right. Last questions as we wrap up here. Uh, kind of a uh, twofer. Uh, what is your view on the 30 year? It looks like. Uh, I, yeah, I guess 30, 30 year versus the center of the curve. So they want to know if you are, if you, do you prefer the 30 year or like the belly of the curve on the treasury curve? Uh, and then the follow on question of that different person asking it, but related is, is there any reason to hold bonds at this point in a portfolio? Uh, these are really good questions. Um, and we've seen the belly come up quite a bit. I mean, we don't have inversions at some, at some point. Um, it's hard because the 30 year you have a lot of non-economic demand for it, which is going to remain. I mean, 30 year projections are very, very hard. Um, there is no other tool than a 30 year bond to move consumption forward by 30 years. And you have a lot of people that who need to do that, like, you know, pension funds, insurers. So I, I, it's possible that the 30 year remains, uh, un, I mean, to me, I mean, I think that both yields need to go up and, and curves need to steepen. I think when you have a, the expectation of a decade of stagnation, that is right. So the correct answer, the economic answer would be the 30 year. I'm just a little uh, concerned that again, the 30 year is a very unique asset uh, that has no equivalent, especially in US dollars. Um, um, so 
I don't know. I'm still gonna go with the thirty year. I think the longer the longer longer yield are the most mispriced in in general. Curves are too flat. Um, bond market at some point will wake up to these inflationary threats. And then the question is: there any reason to own bonds? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, but I think you might, you may want to change where you buy these bonds. I mean, um, is there? I mean, U.S. Treasuries, you yeah, of course still have a little bit because it's the risk of asset, and especially in the environment we're in, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, you know, it's the fall of war, right? Who knows what happens? I mean, there will be dominoes that will fall, so that there is some value for that. But in terms of of providing income, um, I think you need to look outside of the U.S. I think you need to look at Latin America. I mean, uh, you can find you know double digit yield in most Latin American countries, and then the carry is insane in these countries, and and actually. It's, because the central banks have, have hiked faster, look at what Brazil has done, um, inflation is actually coming down. Uh, and the, the currencies are strengthening. So you get the double um, two tailwinds, right? the carry plus the currency appreciation. Uh, you can also look at uh, East Asia. Uh, the two, two countries with positive real interest rates right now are China and Indonesia. Um, if I'm right about China demography, uh, well, I know I'm right about the Chinese demography because you know you can't just bring babies. Uh, if growth is going to slow dramatically in China the way it, it slowed in Japan in the 1980s, I mean the trade in after the Japanese bubble burst was to go long JGBs. Um, so the equivalent is go long Chinese government bonds. Yep. Well, I, my short answer on is there any reason to hold bonds? Our our main asset allocation model, yeah, we have a bond allocation. I think you do want to have bonds in your portfolio. Um, American bonds is U.S. Treasury bonds also. Um, the uh, the term premium is, has turned negative, so you have kind of a term discount, and I think that leads to what you were talking about, which is there are other reasons why I think folks have investors have owned the long bond in the U.S. and that's because it has acted as a natural head to hedge to your equity portfolio since 1998. We've seen the strong negative correlation in stocks and bonds. And I mean, I think that, that that relationship is dissipating and inflation is the thing that will cause that relationship to dissipate theoretically and I think in practice, but the future is an uncertain place. And I don't think you abandon bonds and you abandon and you say that the, the whole framework has shifted already overnight. Maybe it has, but I think you still wanna have that, that potential cushion in the event that we get a, a whiff of deflation, which nobody's talking about now, and we go back to this world where maybe the Fed goes too far or whatever, you know, and we we start seeing a growth scare come through and inflation dissipates um, against the consensus expectation. I think that's still a possibility. There, there are ways to get there within the next couple of years. So yeah, still want to have some bonds underweight them for now though. Um, in any event, we went a little long, but it was a great conversation, Vincent. I appreciate your time and, and coming on and talking to me. Thank you to everybody out there watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Maggie Lake will be back tomorrow with Darius Dale. That'll be a great episode, so make sure you watch. Thanks.